I started the first time I ever heard about the flat earth was on the Joe Rogan podcast. He had mm. on Misha Tate, who was a former um, UFC fighter. Mm. And Joe Rogan said, you know, there are people out there that believe the earth is flat. And I said, no, impossible, mm. because I was indoctrinated into the globe earth from the time I was everybody from the time they were in kindergarten, first grade. And I had this big astronomy book and it was filled with all the color pictures. Look at Mars and Jupiter. And they talked about, you know, position of the sun and everything. I was like, man, I, I was so into it. And then I, I got into reading about the physicists and about astronomy and cosmology. And I'm, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how they pulled the wool over my eyes for so long, but I, I, I completely, I never even imagined. I mean, I've heard that in the past, the distant past, that people thought the earth was flat and about Galileo and Copernicus proving it's actually heliocentric. So then when I heard about this flat earth, I was like flabbergasted. And I'm like, no, this can't be. So I I did some research and the first video I ever came across, it wasn't yours, unfortunately, it was it was allegedly Dave uh, D. Murphy 25. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yeah. And interview that he did on tv probably right it was the interview exactly yeah exactly it's a good one and then it was one point after the other after the other and it was it was like i I thought that that he wouldn't have a leg to stand on i'm like (laughs) i was gonna prove this and he you know he wasn't crazy he was a normal very sane intelligent man making logical points and that just really opened my eyes up, that whole interview. I watched it, I was riveted to the TV. And then it was, you know, obviously maybe just a few days later of researching, I came across your channel, your brilliant videos, and you've done such a service to humanity. I, I call you the father of the Flat Earth Movement. Now, I know that there are others who, even going back to the 1900s, have written about it. When you talk about the, the, uh, the different experiments that they've done, and and but really, you're the one that brought it back into the mainstream somewhere. I, I'm thinking like 2012, 2013, maybe even earlier than that. What, what year did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I 20, remember in, in November, I, I a couple of years before that, I'd been collecting everything I could and I wanted to put out everything all at once because I was kind of fearing for my life at, at that point. I thought this was, you know. I don't know. I, I didn't know, you know what kind of reaction the powers that be would have uh, with somebody coming out with all of this stuff. So my idea was to kind of put it all out at once. So I'd had interviews lined up and I had a documentary. I had my book already written and and uh, my channel already going with other conspiracy stuff. So, um, yeah, and it was uh, the second week of November 2014. And ever since then, it has been a real snowball. There's been what I would call agents uh, come in shortly after the movement that I knew would would happen and talked about in my work (laughs) ahead of time um, because there's things like the Flat Earth Society uh, website and the guy who started at uh, uh, Leo Ferrari back in the 70s, he had an ongoing rivalry with Charles K. Johnson, the president of IFERS, the International Flat Earth Research Society, uh, which I also restarted around that time. And so I had this, you know, premonition that I would there would be a Leo Ferrari to my Charles Johnson at some point. And within about six weeks of putting on my flat earth information, I mean, I spent years looking, there was nothing on there. And then within six weeks, pop, pop, all these people start coming up. Mark Sargent, flat earth clues, all these, uh, all these people that, you know, they had years to, to if, if they were you know, looking at Flat Earth like I was to uh, be putting this stuff up. But then suddenly, right after I put on mine, then this new little community sprouts up beside me. Um, and anyone that's been in the, you know, the, the fringe since then has seen it alongside me. And so there's been kind of like uh, two Flat Earth movements that have grown up since then. Uh, the Flat Earth Society, you could call it central uh, movement with uh, a lot of disinformation and you know lies being told about me and then the organic people like yourself that are just learning about flat earth and trying to spread the word which is what I am myself uh, I'm just uh, a guy that figured this out and 
uh, made a decision that I want to try and see if I can spread this to the entire world because even before I figured out Flat Earth, I was writing conspiracy books and I knew about 9-11 and the New World Order and everything. And finding out about this was just like a you know, whole new level to the rabbit hole. And I figured this is like, it's so big, it affects absolutely everybody. And the Flat Earth, unlike every other conspiracy, it's something that's empirically demonstrable and provable. We can go figure it out ourselves anytime, any day. There's experiments that you can do to f find out for yourself whether we're on a level motionless plane or we're on a spinning, tilting, wobbling space pair, like they tell you. So this is like the Achilles heel of the New World Order in a sense, because it's a it's it's the biggest conspiracy, the mother of all conspiracies. Like you said, it's the thing that most people think is absolutely ridiculous. If there's one conspiracy theory that's not true, it's got to be the flat earth. That's the most ridiculous one. But if you actually look into it, what you find out is that it's the most provable thing. I mean, the one thing you can know in this life is that you're on a level stationary plane. It's it's unlike most other things in this world, you know, things NASA tells you about the sun, the moon, the stars, flat earthers will tell you straight up, we don't know, we've never been there. We're fine with saying, I don't know about the things we don't know, but we're also adamant about saying we know the things that we can know. And the thing we know is that we're on a level stationary plane. And there's many, many ways you can prove it to yourself. The, the most obvious of all being your everyday experience. And that's what brought me to flat earth. I never really thought Flat Earth was crazy, like um, most people do, like you said. I started looking into geocentrism first because, you know, just sitting in meditation, doing yoga, I just got the sense of, are we really spinning 1,000 miles an hour and then around the sun at 66,000 miles per hour and the sun's doing, there's four different motions. They say we're spiraling through the galaxy all at once and they add up to millions of miles of hour of contrary directions. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting there in a lotus pose and a slight breeze going by my face. And, you know, and if an earthquake happened, we'd sure know if we were moving. It's like, you know, I just, is my common sense deluding me? Or are all those scientists and teachers and NASA and all those other people deluding me. Either one sounds pretty crazy because that's one of the things people say to you. They're like, oh, you, know, you think all these scientists and the teachers and they're all lying or they're all in on it? Well, some of them are, but no, most of them are just duped like everyone else. And maybe the thing we're duped about is this, is that our common sense and experience is actually true. That tells us that we're on a level plane we're not moving and everything in the sky revolves around us because that's what you know we experience that's what you see for yourself and that would be the baseline i would think before you jump off to oh no we're actually on a tilting wobbling spinning space pit well you better have a lot of you know concrete evidence to that i should deny my senses and affirm whatever you're telling me <clears throat> So you start looking into it, you know, what is this? What are these globe claims? What is all this proof they have for this spinning globe? And it's pretty damn thin. <laughs> There's not much. And when you look at the flat earth explanations for these things, they make way more sense. And so <clears throat> you go from knowing the earth's a spinning ball and having all these explanations thrown at you about F Foucault's pendulums and Coriolis effect and the setting sun and all this. Then you read some flat earth books and you hear their explanations. Well, 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 flat earth makes way more sense. The more you read about it, the more you look into it to the point that <clears throat> the spinning ball becomes the most ridiculous thing. And you just wonder, how could I have ever believed in that? And like I said, it's it's not a, a belief. I don't I don't believe that I'm on a level stationary earth. I know I am. It's demonstrable. It's exactly what I experience every day of my life. Uh, there's hundreds of experiments you can do that prove it. And there's zero experiments that show that we are spinning or on some curving globe-shaped object. 
so there's a long, uh, sorry about that long monologue, but uh, that was my baseline for where I came to the flat earth. Um, you know, I, I didn't think it was crazy. I thought it, it, the thing that would be crazy is the fact that if it was real, how deluded everyone is like, so everyone's been brainwashed for 500 years. That was the crazy thing to me and still is to this day and, and how difficult it is to try and wake everybody up um, to this really obvious thing. We've just been so blinded to reality that when someone comes along and says, hey, open your eyes, everything you see that, that's a completely obvious to you, that's what's happening. And everyone's like, no, <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean I'm, I'm, I'm motionless? What do you mean everything in the sky revolves around me? Like, <laughs> they've been told otherwise since childhood to the point that it's like the cognitive dissonance is ridiculous and they'll, you know, pitchforks come out and the, <laughs> and the witch hunt starts. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, I know I, I bring it up to friends sometimes and I, I told my best friend today, I'm interviewing you. And I said, he's the, the father of the flat earth movement. And I don't usually talk about that with my friend at all, but he, you know, he, he kind of gave me that, like, you, you really think that the earth is flat? Like, what do you, what do you mean? And, I'm like, <laughs> and I, I tried to explain to him a little bit, but it takes a lot. Like you wrote this wonderful book called flat earth FAQ that you put out a couple of months ago. And this book is great. What I love about this book, Eric, I'm going through it. My girlfriend gave it to me. You have all these color pictures in it. And you have chapters dedicated to all the different aspects of Flat Earth. And it, it, for anybody that wants to know about Flat Earth, break it down easily, and they're not really into watching all the videos, but they like book, book format, I love book format, this is the book I would get right here. You did you did write Flatlantis. And this book, I think, is also very good. It's a little, it's it goes into some other things and it's more detailed, but I think this book is a little better just because of all the color pictures and how simple you made it. And really, if anybody wants to know how do the seasons work, you know, how does, how does the, how does day and night work and all that, you have those videos on your channel and I implore people to go through your channel and look at that because it explains it all. Because if, even when I started learning about the flat earth, I, I was amazed. I was blown away. I couldn't get enough of it. You're telling me the sun is these, I think, uh, they said 32 miles in diameter. And I was like, what? 32 miles in diameter and moon, like they're the same size. And there's so many things about it that blew my mind, the firmament and the ice wall. And, um, you know, but as I was looking more into it, you wrote that also a book, a uh, 200, um, proofs the earth is flat. That book, I mean, that book, all these illustrations, like how can somebody put all of that science into books and videos for it to be like just complete nonsense? It's not. And what I don't get, Eric, is how did they, fool us for 500 years how do they how do they just it, it's such a big lie it and it's not just the flat earth it's with the other conspiracy theories that you mentioned too you know you talked about the dinosaurs and you talked about nuclear bombs not existing and you also at one time on your channel had that great documentary the greatest story never told and i, I think you had to take it down but it's still up on the internet to see and oh my god that that documentary will open your eyes too and i'm not i'm not I don't know if we can even get into that because it's so controversial, but how do they get away with, with the oligarchs or the powers that be pulling the wool over our eyes and showing us something that's not even like a subtle difference. It's, it's a black and white difference. How do they do that to us? Right. Uh, I think the, the answer is uh, propaganda over time. It certainly wasn't a, you know, quick process when Copernicus came, I mean, well, because it, I say 500 years, they first came out with this idea 2,500 years ago with the, the Greeks, Aristotle, Eratosthenes, uh, Plato, they had some quote unquote proofs of their spherical earth that they thought of uh, that are still used today, like boats disappearing over the horizon and eclipses supposedly being caused by the earth, uh, you know, uh, shadow and these kind of things. Um, but it didn't catch on at all and nobody believed or even talked about the spherical earth theory again until about the 1500s AD, about 2000 years later when Copernicus uh, wrote his book. And then shortly after that, get Newton and Kepler and, and the idea starts uh, taking hold amongst certain astronomers, but still not uh, among the populace at large. 
and you still had establishment uh, astronomers, well-known ones like Tycho Brahe, going against them and you know affirming the stationary Earth. Um, so, and then that goes on for a couple hundred years until Robotham's time. So, 1860s, he comes out with his uh, flat Earth material. And so now at this point, you get the insight by seeing newspaper articles and the way he writes that it has now taken off quite a bit in the Royal, uh, what are they called, the Royal Astronomical Society. They're, they've been formed and they have publications that they push out to people. So, um, since the Gutenberg press, you know, 1500s or so, I think they had the next couple hundred years to pump out their version through um, books. And then, um, so when Robotham came along, he, it, it seems like he was the counterculture. Like most people at that point were not flat earthers. So they had uh, succeeded in, you know, gaining the majority worldview within few hundred years at that point and he was you know him and then shortly after many others um, from his group um, started to turn the tides quite a bit um, I don't know the exact figures I couldn't say but there was quite a, a rivalry going between the flat earth and the globe earth in the mid 1800s up until about the turn of the century um, and I think that's when globe earth got codified into public schools and shortly after that in the 50s slash 60s is when you get NASA and I think since then is when it's really solidified so it's it's actually been a pretty slow process to getting the whole world believing that we're on a spinning globe um, there's always been pockets of people that knew about the flat earth and those pockets were way bigger back 500 years ago, 400 years ago, and like I said, mid 1800s to the turn of the 19th century, there was a renaissance, a flat earth renaissance that happened, and there was almost a flip that happened there to people understanding reality and throwing that thing out uh, the globe. Um, and hopefully now with the internet and this new resurgence that I've tried to spearhead, we're going to be able to really do it this time, because now we have an opportunity like the flat earthers, even even in Charles Johnson's time, he was post NASA somewhat. Um, he didn't have the internet at his disposal, and uh, you know the members of the International Flat Earth Research Society in his day were just over a thousand or two. Whereas now, you know, we're reaching tens of millions of people, um, and more, I mean more than that now, really hundreds of millions we've reached. Pretty much everybody now knows that the flat earth is a new subject that crazy fringe people are talking about again. Um, 10 years ago, nobody would have said that. 10 years ago, it's just flat earth, what the hell is that? Now, at least somebody's like, yeah, my father-in-law said the earth's flat. What is that all about? So it's, it's definitely getting around. And uh, if we can use the internet and the other tools at our disposal to, to keep pushing this, uh, one, I think, you know, getting this known on a mass scale is feasible. And two, once that happens, all these other systems and conspiracies and problems uh, with government and society that are happening, I think are gonna crumble because I, I've noticed it when people wake up to the flat earth, it's just like the blinders come off and suddenly they're like a sponge and they start sucking up all of this really good information that people should have been researching but has been censored and suppressed for so long because they just you know you realize like if i've been lied to about this what else is wrong and then you know you, your friend that told you about flat earth will probably give you a heads up whoa really you want to know now you're all right and then in short span we can really make some changes that need to be made here so i, I find this to be one of the most important subjects that we can talk about um because of the potential effect it has it's like what does it matter the shape of the earth it's it's so deep yeah if, if it was just the shape of the earth whether it's a square or a rectangle or whatever it's like yeah i get it that doesn't matter it doesn't really so i understand that line of thinking but what it really is is it's about the lie and how all pervasive and how fundamental and foundational this lie is and 
And when you realize that you can be deceived on that scale, it creates an awakening like Neo in the Matrix or something. It's it's really transformative. Yeah, I think what it is, they, they started like with the nuclear bombs. They showed these blasts back in the 1950s. Back then, we couldn't stop. We didn't have a tape. We couldn't analyze it. So And people didn't think the government would lie to them. So they just believed it. And then the, the government, you know, uh, perpetuated this lie with NASA and, and all the whole space program. And then all of a sudden, technology gets to where it is today. And we can look back and see that it was a fake, like the moon landings. Like you, you illustrate this. There's so many uh, laughable pieces of evidence to demonstrate that the moon landings didn't happen. Um, and now it's like they have to continue with it, right? Because they can't just say, hey, we, you know, it was all a fake. You know, we just wanted to fool you, you know. So they keep perpetuating it. And I don't know if you've seen, like, the, I'm sure you have, the, the SpaceX footage of the rockets that go up and they come down and all that stuff in the car, uh, the Tesla that goes into space. I mean, to me, it looks fake. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know Eddie Bravo talks about it all the time. It just looks so fake to him. And he has all the battles with Joe Rogan uh, and everybody, really. <laughs> People really get on Eddie Bravo a lot. But he brings a lot of good points to the table, and he's very entertaining. But but where do you see this going with with NASA? Are they going to continue to perpetuate this? Because like, one of the things that you said, there's a couple of things that you said really about NASA. One is that we have this supposed atmosphere, and then we just magically pop out into the vacuum of space. Like that can't exist in nature. We can't have an atmosphere right next to a vacuum. And the other thing is like when rockets do go out into space and they're in the vacuum, what are they pushing off to go anywhere? They would just be like just spinning out of control endlessly they wouldn't be able to go anywhere so i mean there's there's a there's a couple of very logic logical inconsistencies there with nasa and where do you see that going because it's it just seems so fake how do how do how do people like still look at this and say it's real right even elon musk himself when the tesla car was up in space uh during the press conference <clears throat> He said, uh, it's just so preposterous, it's, but it's, uh, it's, it looks so fake, you know it's real. Because uh, cause if it was fake, we would have we made it look much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really funny quote, but it's, it's like if you're a liar backed into a corner with people telling you how fake your little CGI car in space looks, what else are you going to say? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it looks so fake, you know it's real, because <laughs> if it was uh, a fake, we would have made it look a lot better than that. <laughs> which is pretty much what they say about the terrible lunar lander that you can go back and look at now from the the, the 60s and 70s, the, the six moon landings. The lunar landers are just laughable. The, it looks like they're made with cardboard, construction paper, tin foil, and tape. I mean, you can see where there's tape all over the outside of it and stuff. It really looks like a um, grade school project, uh, art school project or something doesn't look like anything that would even survive a, you know, a trip off a mountain or something, let alone go into the moon and back. Um, it's really laughable. But again, the internet, they didn't think when they were making these things that people would have the internet to go back and study all of these things in detail and communicate and be able to expose them like uh, on the scale that we are today. Um, when they did the original uh, moon landing hoax, uh, they forced the uh, news channels, NASA did, to play a recording of a recording that they sent out to everybody. And so the only thing people, it, that's why it was like this like ghostly black and white, it looked weird, it didn't look like any other recording that, that you see. But it worked perfectly for, for them because, you know, they're on the moon and, you know, something that looks so alien was perfect. <clears throat> Which is another thing, which is I think why they don't really want want to or have to go back to the moon now with the camera quality that they have today, because it would be so much more difficult to fake it. Um, that Artemis thing they they sent to the moon, you know, why didn't they land it? You know, why not? <laughs> they they drove they flew by and gave some more awful CGI. I did a video on that that instantly got banned from YouTube. Um, but anyway. Uh, to answer your question, so why why are they continuing to do all of this terrible CGI? 
So now, what's next? Now they're going to go to Mars and everything. Well, there's something called Project Bluebeam. Have you ever heard of that? It sounds familiar, but no. Uh, so there's like, I guess it was a NSA maybe declassified document that came out called Project Bluebeam, talking about these protocols for how they would bring in a one world government doing so through uh, projected lights in the sky and making people believe that there is an outside alien threat or alien friendship coming to save or take over the earth. And like the movie Independence Day, we all have to gather together to fend off the alien threat or if they go with the friendship scenario, we all have to gather together to befriend the aliens and do whatever they say. Um, <clears throat> so what the, if this declassified document is, is true, what it's saying is that the government has technology, the likes of which that they can put holographic displays in the sky so convincing that we would think that we're under an alien invasion. And they also have uh, forget the word, uh, the, what they call it, but it's a type of sound technology that goes directly into your brain. It's like shot into you. But if somebody was standing somewhere near you, but it wasn't shot to them, they wouldn't hear it. So it's not traditional hearing. Um, so this like a voice to brain technology or something. Uh, by using this in the Project Bluebeam report, they say that alongside the holographic displays of either aliens or there could be like Jesus or, or some religious figures um, in the sky, there would be messages beamed directly into people's brains saying like, I'm an alien or I'm Jesus or I'm God or something, do this or that. Um, so, I mean, this, now this sounds completely you know crazy to somebody that has never heard of this, but it's out there. And if you're hearing me say this now, and something like this happens, you know, it could be a, you know, it could really save people from being further deluded. So basically, we're talking about how over 500 years or whatever, people have been completely deluded into believing we're on like this spinning ball careening through space, and we've, we were created through a big bang that has no spiritual or immaterial element to it, consciousness, life, the beauty and diversity of nature all exploded into existence and then we evolved from monkeys and all this crap. We already believe all that. The next step is this alien step and the world government step where everyone believes that, you know, that, you know we can go off planet to Mars, you know, that's the next thing, we're going to go to Mars. And so the it's just the continuation of this ridiculous propaganda scheme that everyone is under. And the next steps now is basically just solidifying it to the point that we have a one world government and whatever they claim the aliens do and say is going to be what people go along with. Um, so I think that, I mean, and again, this is a theory, this is speculation. You're asking, what do I think the future is for NASA or a prediction, or why are they even continuing it? The, 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 my, the real answer would be, I don't know. Obviously, I have no idea why, why they're doing this. Money? They definitely are making a heck of a lot of money by doing it. <clears throat> but I also wanted to, to say what I just said, because that's a possibility. And if that happens, and people aren't talking about it, and nobody knows that that is something that is out there, Imagine how much more deluded we would be if an Independence Day-like scenario happened and everybody believed that there was an alien invasion and the world government, UN or whatever, the UN coming to save us is the only thing that would help. But in reality, it was the UN and the forces behind it that uh, created this false flag event to get more power and control. Yeah, like um, <clears throat> like a problem, reaction, solution. Right. Exactly, exactly. I mean, this is really what they do anyway, 
right? They that's that's their agenda. Mm-hmm. And um, you made a lot of videos. You made one on uh, the Bilderbergers. You made one on um, uh, the other. I'm sorry, the other. What's the other? The other well, one. There's a bunch of the groups that little you know trilateral societies, the trilateral tri- commission, right? Trilateral commission and the Council of for, yeah Council, Council of Foreign, Foreign Relations. Relations, right? The Royal Institute of International Affairs, Skull yes. and Bones, the Freemasons, the Jesuits. There's so many groups of people that are involved in this conspiracy or these conspiracies because there's an overlap and trying to get to the tippy top of the capstone is pretty much impossible because they probably keep themselves well hidden and these groups that are all that I just mentioned um, this is how they maintain um, what would you call it a, a buffer a barrier between the people who are ultimately responsible and just the minions who carry out their dictates. Yeah, I mean, definitely Flat Earth is the biggest conspiracy, I think, that you talk about. But you, you, I mentioned some of the others before, but I wanted to ask you, do you know or have have you looked into the jet fuel hoax conspiracy? Hmm. I, I know about it and looked into it enough to make the con my personal conclusion that I don't know enough uh, about planes and how how it works to say either way, because I've seen material on both sides that seemed quite convincing, um, saying that you there's no way you can fit that much fuel into a plane and people who allegedly fuel planes saying, yeah, you can, it's not a problem and all this. And, you know, again, this is so here's a good example of a conspiracy theory that I can't get to the bottom of it. And maybe if I really did some deep investigative work and somehow got access to planes and people that were involved um, in refueling and these kind of things, I could maybe figure it out. Um, But it's so different than flat earth where I can just take a Nikon P900 or 1000 to a mountaintop or to a seaside and see much farther than I should be able to see on a globe of given proportions, uh, even on a globe of 10 times bigger proportions. You know, we, we've been able to see so far that the idea that the Earth is globular in any form is ridiculous. And beyond that, of course, there's other proofs like water, which just simply cannot curve when it's in a um, uh, still state and confined, which the oceans are. Uh, every lake is, and you know, going off subject, but just to say that there's so many ways that we can prove that uh, Earth is not curving. Yeah, I mean, I, I lost a good friend uh, talking about the curvature of the Earth, and I told her when when boats go out to sea, I said, do you know, and you can't see them anymore when they go so far. Are they going over the curvature? And she said, yes. And then I said, no, they're not, because if you look with a P90, you look with a telescope, there you go. You can see them again. Uh, it's it's like a law of perspective. It's a perspective thing. And so isn't it, Eric, like just proving that the Earth is not a globe as easy as saying, well, just look, look at the curvature. We, we can look 50, 60 miles away from the shore of Lake Michigan. We can see the Chicago skyline right there. And like they say it's a mirage. But and there's there's a lot of proof for that all around the world. There are places where you can see 50, 60, even 100 miles away when those landmarks should be recessed well below the horizon. Isn't that enough to prove to people that we're not living on a on a curved earth? You know, it it seems to me it would be. Mm. Yeah, uh, they titled books back in the day, 100 Proofs the Earth is Not a Globe. Uh, it was one of the books back in the late 1800s that was written. And so I, I wrote my book and I called it 200 Proofs, Earth is Not a Spinning Ball. And people are like, what, proof? If you got proof, you only need one. What, what is proofs? There, there's no such, proof isn't plural. And it's like, yeah, you're right, I get it. Um, and it's not because in reality, you only need one. And that's all there could be. If proof means proof. <laughs> and so if you have proof, that's all it is. And you just gave that one, the observational proof. I just gave another one, the level water proof, and there's literally hundreds of them, and any one of them is sufficient as, you know, 
demonstrable proof of what you're living on, uh, barring some other uh, evidence against it, which there isn't any. For example, uh, bendy water, you know, what bendy bodies of water. Can you or I make that happen? We can see it in uh, NASA photos or videos, which are CGI and or fisheye lens videos. And we can watch them claim that they're doing it in space with these little water balls that they make. And these again are augmented virtual reality. And so can you or I do that? Can we make water into a ball? Or can we make it stick to or curve around some structure? It's impossible for us to do. But them with their special magic Hollywood tricks uh, showing you on a screen, they can do it and then call you silly and ridiculous and crazy for believing your own senses and experiments and what you can demonstrate. So, you know, isn't that weird how it's been flipped like that, that what we can clearly see and experience for ourselves and what we can prove through our own experiments is laughable to what the experts can show you on film. They can't, yeah, demonst they can't demonstrate it to you in person. No astronaut comes and bends water in front of you, but they can do it on film. Oh, I'm hey guys, I'm here, here in a harness up on the ISS and uh, I got some augmented virtual reality coming here. Oh, look at this, it's a water bowl, you know? So they're, they're just blue screen magicians faking everybody out. And uh, we believe them and think that believing what experts say on video is, is what's smart nowadays. And believing yourself or your friend, your father-in-law that told you that the earth's flat and everything that he's telling you, that's dumb. That's crazy. Why would you believe your family? Believe this guy you don't know on television. You know, it's like, I find it quite upside down the way people react to things like this and how they'll often shun friends and family members for even looking into these subjects and act like it's the craziest thing ever when, no, it's common sense. It's what we experience. Like, uh, crazy would be David Icke reptilian shape-shifting lizards from Draconis coming in on the hollow moon base and controlling us through mind beams, like he said in two books ago or whatever. Um, flat Earth is not crazy. It's apparent. It's obvious. Do, do you think it's possible that beyond, well, beyond the firmament, let's say, because I, I, we don't know how far the firmament extends, but Admiral I would Byrd, say I don't, I don't know that there is a firmament. I heard you mention the ice wall earlier as well. Um, I mean, there, there are places in Antarctica that are elevated to 150 to 200 feet and they go on for miles. There are also places that seem to somewhat gradually go up as well. So Antarctica is a, in the flat earth model, is a circumference of the earth. I've never personally traversed the circumference, but uh, it seems to be that as you hit, it, self in any direction leads you to Antarctica on either model. Um, but on the globe model, it's just a tiny ice continent on the bottom of the ball, whereas um, on the flat Earth it is a perimeter. And the old, um, like Captain Cook, uh, Captain Nares, and some of the early explorers that went to the south, they logged way more miles uh, going, traversing the Antarctic than these new explorers claim to do nowadays when they, they claim to circumnavigate the Antarctic. Uh, and I'm getting off topic. What do you remember why I was <laughs> I happened to no, go off? I was I was only asking you what about the firmament and I was saying do you do Sorry, you think do you think that the there's firmament. a yeah you said you don't you don't you're not even sure if it exists. Exactly. So with the I just wanted to make that caveat about ice walls and firmaments because people pull you up on that. So I mean yeah there's definitely some somewhat of a you know places where the ice is a wall how far that Antarctica extends in the mountains and the snow and everything, that is unknown. And the idea of a firmament is what potentially it could extend to. So there may be a point in which Antarctica 
goes outwards and then there's a stopping point and then it could be like a dome or some type of solid fixture that encloses us and so that would be like what the bible um, seems to call a firmament um, and so i'm open to that idea but i don't i don't talk about firmaments or ice walls in a what would you call it a foregone conclusion kind of way i more speak of them as good possibilities probabilities something like that but it could also be for instance an infinite plane or there could be some other type of barrier or you know the globers like to think there would be an edge and you fall off and i certainly don't think that's what it is but i haven't gotten there so couldn't necessarily rule out something like that so um the the most honest answer you can give to these things is I don't know. And so that's I just wanted to pitch in there to say that on little things like that, I, I say I don't know rather than that there's a firmament or something There may be. But hasn't the government tried to kind of go out into space and they got they they keep getting a barrier and they shot nuclear or well not nuclear, but they shot missiles into the firmament. And I, I think it was called Project um, Fishbowl. Right. They tried to get out. And they couldn't get out is that yeah, so there's is that true? i mean again i don't know because i wasn't there so there there is exactly uh something called operation fishbowl and they were shooting missiles uh some sort into the air and i mean there's also like have you ever seen the encyclopedia entry in like the britannica in the 50s that talked about that there's a firmament in antarctica and that it goes up like 13,000 feet or something like there's real specifics um, so th certainly there are um, what I would call hearsay uh, that points towards that being possible. There's also um, hearsay about people that claim to have worked in Antarctica and they worked on something they called sky ice, which is pieces of the firmament. They claim that you can't even take them out of Antarctica because they melt instantly. So they're like so cold that they can only work with it in Antarctica and it's only in solid form um, there in the firmament or whatever. So, but again, all of these things to me, they're interesting possibilities. I, I, I listen, I've, I've read uh, accounts like these, but um, again, for me, the, the beauty and importance of flat earth is its demonstrable and objective nature and how it's something that everybody can know and figure out for themselves. And I want to promote those aspects of the level stationary Earth rather than the ice wall and the firmament or some other aspects that do seem to go along with it in most cases, you know, in, in a lot of books, etc. But if we personally, the public, ha haven't gotten empirical demonstrable evidence of certain aspects of the flat earth you know cosmology then i don't like to espouse it 100 percent. just like maps is another thing i don't promote any one flat earth map as being the flat earth map i use them as approximations or visualizations but admit that myself and pretty much anyone else out there especially with things like the antarctic treaty isn't able to explore independently to even find out if any map or what map would be correct. So we're at a disadvantage to be able to confirm a lot of things like that. Um, so I, I like to separate what, pe what parts of the flat earth argument are speculation and hearsay and what parts of the flat earth argument are empirically demonstrable for everyone to see for themselves and actually objective. Yeah, very understandable. Uh, would would the sun and the moon kind of fit into that category too? Where not really sure because I heard it said that the sun and the moon are about thirty two miles in diameter. But I'm I'm very curious to know because you were you are probably one of the the probably the top expert in the world on flat Earth. But um, I'm not trying to put you in a corner. But I'm just I'm curious myself. What can do you know about the are they just lumin luminance or do you think they're beyond the so-called firmament um are they 32 miles in diameter or do you think they're bigger smaller how far do you think they are away from the earth from our experience 
the sun and the moon appear the same size. So that's one thing we can say from observation, whereas the globe model claims that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon and 400 times further away, so they just coincidentally appear exactly the same size, which even if you believe that, I find that to be a fairly good case for intelligent design, which most of these globers don't believe in. It's like, oh, so you, you think it just perfectly appears exactly the same size and just coincidentally eclipses all the time for us? Um, but it, that that's just this cosmic coincidence that your non-god <laughs> created uh, through the 400 time bigger, 400 time further away sun. It's pretty funny. Um, but to answer the idea of a potentially 30, 32 mile diameter sun and moon being between 700 to 3000 miles away is what the 19th century flat earth authors claimed. So they used sextants and plane trigonometry to find uh, you know, the amount of degrees um, that the sun, well, you know, just Pythagorean theorem, basically. Um, and so using Pythagorean theorem and a sextant, they decided that it would be 32 miles in diameter and no more than 3000 miles from the surface of the earth at any time, um, though there was Quite a bit of debate on that and some people said as low as 700 miles from the surface so different flat earthers in that time had different ideas just like to this day you know the flat earthers of the current generation a lot of them have varying ideas of where the altitudes they think the sun and moon might be and there's varying models from like the vedic model um which which has the sun and moon varying in altitude over the year so in the Vedic model, they are higher uh, in the south, and it's like a bowl shape. And then there's another model where they're higher in the north. <laughs> um, and they, any of these could work, any of these models. Um, all we really know is that the sun moves 15 degrees per hour in a circle around us, and it moves in and out from the tropics over the course of every six months, and the moon does this exact same thing, but it does every month. <laughs> when, you know, when it comes to gravity, it's the same thing, right? Because when, when I learned of flat Earth, um, I just thought, you know, gravity is gravity. But then, you know, flat Earth experts like yourself and and uh, D. Murphy and others talk about density and buoyancy rather than gravity. Um, was was that always known, or was that something that like how how did they pull the wool over our eyes on that one too? Right. I mean, the natural physics of density and buoyancy already perfectly explained why objects fall down long before this idea of gravity or or Newton's book came out. Um, and so, gravity basically is just a placeholder term for what you need if you turn the Earth into a spinning globe. Density and buoyancy alone can't now explain why things rise and fall. You have to have uh, this attractive pulling force at the center of massive objects that, um, you know, one, once an object becomes significantly small enough, like anything you or I could experiment on, oh, suddenly it doesn't have those properties anymore. It's just at scales that are so large that you can't recreate them and you just have to believe Newton and NASA and whoever else. So it's just a inventive way of taking something that's completely obvious, which is that objects that are denser than the medium surrounding them fall, and objects that are lighter than the medium surrounding them, like a helium balloon, for instance, rise. And you know that's why an air bubble rises up in the water, but a rock will fall down in the water. And a normal rock falls down in water, but a pumice stone floats on the water. Why? Density. It all depends on the relative density between the object and the medium surrounding it. And that perfectly explains uh, the movement of objects, the so-called gravity on a flat Earth. You need nothing else to explain it. Whereas on a globe, you suddenly need to explain to people why, at a scale too big for them to recreate, 
Huge oceans, buildings, and upside-down people are being stuck like a magnet to the bottom of a spinning ball, but they can still jump up and down and, you know, uh, birds and bugs and everything can just flap their little wings and escape the grips of gravity that the entire buildings and, and the oceans can't do. Uh, and so, again, they get away with this by having this convoluted math that they've created for gravity that shows how exponentially gravity works once you have enough mass. And once you don't have enough mass, like the bugs and the birds, oh, they can escape it. That's fine. You know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just just like relativity, for example, is another one. It, they are thought experiments that have deluded people into thinking that people standing upside down and oceans curving around a spinning ball somehow makes sense and is, is logical. And flat Earth is ridiculous. Um, relativity, for example, it tells everybody through this gymnastic uh, thought experiment that, yeah, it feels like we're not moving and everything's in the sky is moving and revolving around us except Polaris. But really, everything is moving, including Polaris and you. And therefore, you can't know if anything is stationary or what would be stationary. The only thing you can know is how objects are moving relative to other objects. OK, Einstein, thanks. So all that did is now with this thought experiment, I can't know that I'm on a stationary plane anymore. I have to, I have to say that, oh, it could be like a train. If you're on a train, Eric, and it's going 60 miles an hour, and you throw up a ball, the ball comes right back down in your hand. So isn't the, the Earth and the atmosphere spinning like Velcro, and you just can't tell, right? That's what's happening. This is what people will say, of course. And you can tell them, well, throw the ball outside the train and see what happens. You know, there's, there's a difference between doing it inside and on the outside. Also, it's just an explanation for how it could be on a moving object. You're not providing proof that you're on a moving object. People come to with this to me all the time as if this thought experiment is somehow proof that we're moving. Eric, if, you, if you're on a train and you throw the ball up and the ball comes back, so we're on a spinning globe, right? It's like, it's that the best you could say is we could be on a spinning globe, you know, because of that. Because the other thing that could be happening is you're on a, you're, the train's not moving and you just, that's it. And you just gave me the example of a moving train. Uh, so, and that's the thing with every flat earth versus globe earth example is like that. You think that there's this gotcha home run thing for the globe that only makes sense on a globe because you've only ever heard the globe explanation. And then when you hear the flat earth explanation, it's just, it's always way more down to earth, way more basic, way more common sense, almost to the point that you're like, why didn't I think of that? It's like, well, that, that's actually really obvious. And then, like I said, with the, the scale, the globe earth, flat earth scale, the, the flat earth stuff is just so basic and common sense and demonstrable. And everything that the globe earth says is just these thought experiments about like, yeah, but what if you throw up a ball in a train and, and put gravity and all these things that you can't do yourself. Um, and this is why it takes time and why I recommend people take the time to actually look into this. It's because it's, it's not ridiculous. And the more you look into it, you find out that what you've been believing your whole life is ridiculous. But to make that transition really takes concerted effort and it takes the suspension of disbelief. You have to do like, uh, I think it was Aristotle said, and be able to hold two contradictory ideas in your mind for an extended period of time without believing in either of them. Because that's how you can get to truth. And if you can't do that, you're just going to be deluded by whatever the first thing you find is. To, to be able to weigh out, you know, the evidence for and against certain things, you have to look at this side, the other side, and the other other side that has nothing to do with these sides. There's usually, you know, at least three sides to every argument. And if you've only looked at one or even two, you maybe you're you're you know you're not looking at the whole thing. And that's absolutely the case when it comes to cosmology. We've only been presented 
with one version and everybody just thinks that that's gospel truth and it's only because the other sides side sides have been so suppressed and censored that you think that way because if they were given equal time equal opportunity in anyone's mind i guarantee everyone would be a flat earther mm. yeah very powerful thought because i'm thinking about all my favorite science fiction movies and they all involve you know going off world going into space spaceships like interstellar right which, which was a great movie yeah cinematic star wars you know star, star wars. wars they got all the best <laughs> all the best <laughs> movies <laughs> they do you don't you don't have like a real good flat earth movie but maybe one of these days right. you know maybe we can make a movie about admiral bird or something but um you know I, I there are people i know you have a lot of haters and a lot of detractors because people just can't they'll never come to the flat earth no matter how many proofs they see you know how many books you write and videos you create People are just not going to believe it. And and what do you say to people who claim that you're a shill, or you're being paid by the government to put out propaganda, or you're 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 actually a secret multi multi millionaire from all this? Um, I I mean, does, do you ever do you ever like see that and just like what what do you think? Because I'm sure people still say it to this day. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I I'm glad that people are skeptical of personalities in the community in this conspiracy community so i don't really want to discourage people from considering things like that like are there people like i would say some of the more obvious ones like alex jones or david ike that could be put out there and paid by the government or by some of these organizations that we were talking about earlier to mix in some of the true conspiracy information with some absolute batshit insanity to throw people off the case. Uh, is it possible that there's people that are like that and not everyone who's in the conspiracy community is a 100% genuine person? I would say absolutely. For sure there's people like that. How could you possibly have the level of control, uh, world control and propaganda that we have and you know, there's quotes like from that Lenin quote: "The uh, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves." So I mean, some of the most um, you know uh, successful leaders in history know about these tactics, which are when you start a movement, there's going to be an anti-movement. How do you deal with the anti-movement? Well, the wisdom of the ages is you lead the anti-movement to your movement too. And so I think this is on a huge scale, actually, much bigger than most people even give a thought to, that the conspiracy truth community at large is actually shill run. I don't think the vast majority of conspiracy channels out there are normal people that have a passion and they want to save the world and they want to help and they're putting their effort in every single day to try and make a better world you know no monetary gain or very little that i think is a minority or at least in for big channels you know uh the, the channels that I have found that seem the most genuine are the smallest ones. And the bigger they get, the more little red flags just pop up. And I can't, you know, like you, so you're asking about me. The question is, am I a shill? I know I'm not a shill, but I definitely, I'm skeptical just like everyone else. So I don't um, blame anyone for thinking I might be, other than the fact that, like, I think you should have better intuition and discernment, because I don't think that I fit the bill <laughs> at all. And there's so many other people that fit the bill much better. Um, so um, I, I'm i just wanting to say that I, I'm skeptical of so many people in the community. And so I think it's absolutely fine for people to do that, to be skeptical. Rather though, than focusing so much on the personalities, like 
is this guy a shill? Oh, what about this guy? Do you think he's a shill? It's it's fruitless to the most point, and it just creates a lot of unnecessary drama because the most the thing that is really important is lies and disinformation, and those happen to be the two things that shills do, and they fit into their work. And so the the more you can catch uh, someone out on something that is provably disinformation and or a lie, that gives at least weight towards them being what you could call a disinformant. A paid shill is really hard to prove because you're not nobody's getting paycheck stubs, and you can't tell, you know, to that degree, uh, who's who, so to speak. But just like say with um, when you're dating and you're looking for the right mate red flags come up and when somebody's there's too many red flags you stop dating them you're just like no this one's it's just too much and then other people you know green flags come up and you're just like this this really you know rings true authenticity legitimacy and i have the same kind of intuition and discernment when it comes to the conspiracy community um so uh, just again, I think there's plenty of shills in the movement. I don't necessarily think that pointing the fingers and naming names all the time is super productive. Um, though completely staying away from that subject and acting and playing saying kumbaya and acting like everybody's the same and and we should all get along and there are no liars or disinformationists in the truth community. Everyone in the truth community is equally honest as everyone else. And, and and equally as informed and well researched and the things they say are equally truthful like obviously not obviously there is a hierarchy and it's up to our own subjective sensibilities and our research to figure out who's up you know higher up on that mountain of legitimacy and accuracy um so yeah keep doing it i guess everyone who thinks i'm a shill keep looking into me if you think I'm a shill, keep looking into my work. I think you'll find out that I'm not. And uh, if you think somebody else is, do the same. Like, I think it's a it's it's a credible thing to do to be your own authority. Don't look up to me or anyone else as the flat Earth guru or the conspiracy guru or like this guy. Like everything this guy says, I believe. Or like you know, too many people do that and and approach reality or uh, research or anything in that sense and that's what got us into this um place you know in the first place is believing authority figures rather than trusting ourselves and what we can figure out for ourselves so i would say don't believe anyone including yourself i don't like the word belief just experiment just you know live in the mystery and and get closer towards what could be the truth. Yeah, and so how do you uh, primar- How do you primarily do your research? Is it on the internet, books? Um, what do you do? To, and, and do you have any new theories uh, that you've been researching lately? Yeah, yeah, mostly using the internet, books and documentaries. Um, and yeah, actually um, wanted to talk with you maybe about the, uh, the soul trap subject. I know you've been delving into that and uh, so have I. So we could definitely talk a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I had a guy named Howdy Mikowski on my show. Yeah, yeah. He, he's very and, interesting. I've talked to him and uh, read his book. Nice. So you, yes, I'm sure you have you have some knowledge of it. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, what, do, what are your general thoughts of this reality? Is it do you have more like Buddhist and Hinduist belief that we reincarnate? Ultimately, it's it's a school, it's a learning place, and that we can go on and become enlightened and maybe leave here, go to somewhere better. Or do you do you see it as a soul trap in that no matter what we do, our souls are being reincarnated, trapped back into this system, which is diabolical and is being controlled and manipulated by potentially the the archons that are just outside of this dimension. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? Which way do you lean? I'm curious. Yeah, um, I, I definitely lean a little bit more towards the soul trappy side than the school of lifey side. Um, though I think maybe there is uh, a little middle ground because 
it does seem like part of the deal here is getting our consent. And so at some point along this journey, it does seem that our soul gave its consent to experience what we're experiencing now. And so in that sense, um, it's it's not a, well, uh, the word trap still could work. Um, sometimes the word prison is used, for example. Um, so maybe not so much a prison, but a, uh, a, tra a trap or a lure, the soul lure system. So <laughs> another way to say the solar system would be the soul lure system. And it, it seems that way to me that, and, and this is, now we're getting in, I was talking about uh, speculation and stuff. This whole subject is completely speculation, um, but it's, it's infinitely interesting because something's going to happen to us after we die. And I would say nobody now living can give you the definitive answer to what it is. So we're all stuck in the same place with this mysterious subject in that we've got the rest of our lives to try and get closer and closer to the truth of what might happen at the moment of and after death. But none of us are going to be able to go there and come back to, to tell about it. Um, even near-death experiencers, well, they're near-death experiencers, not death experiencers, and there's likely some big differences between the things that they are experiencing and the things that happen uh, to people who don't come back to their the same earthly body. Um, but the message from near-death experiencers is very similar across accounts. And that's what leads to this subject, this soul trap subject. And that is that when you die, your soul or your consciousness, it seems to rise out of your body and they see themselves lying on the doctor's table and um, trying to be resuscitated, for example. And then they might be greeted by angels or religious figures that they believed in or deceased family members who will then take them through a life review, like people talk about seeing their life flash before their eyes. So suddenly these, all your, these events all at once, everything in your life, you get to see it like a fast forward, slow-mo, rewind, whatever, replay, like a DVD. Meanwhile, there will be angels or your relatives or whatever guiding you through this experience and subtly also making you feel a little bit guilty or shame, embarrassed uh, for certain things that you did during your life review. And they start to lead you towards, um, you know, specific events. And inevitably what happens through these accounts is that they will try to get your consent to go into a light uh, or to be born again to reincarnate with a new body with the opportunity to right the wrongs that they pointed out for you in the life review and say like you know you can fix your karma and go back there and then next life your kid will be your parents and your parent will be your kid and we'll design all of these life you know events for you to have an opportunity to you know, slowly refine your karma and do a little bit better each lifetime. And then eventually you graduate to, I don't know what, some other better world, apparently. Um, that is, and so that's the synopsis, I guess, of the near death experience. And these people, like they come back and a lot of them, they are never afraid of death again. They feel, felt like this loving embrace. The light was all love and the angels and the dead relatives were all loving and they have a mission so they have to come back um now with the idea though of a soul trap this is different and i wanted to relate it to say like a school nowadays like a public school because these seem to be the two competing ideas is that life is a school or life is like a prison life in this world in this particular realm because there are certain things in this realm, in this reality, that are, that don't have to be 
For example, predators, parasites, psychopaths, natural disasters, the memory wipe, when we, or, or just, you don't even call that, just the fact that we have no memory or knowledge of what happened before our birth or how this world was created or what life is. If we were, you know, we're aspects of God, for example, I like to think of it this way. Imagine every night you're dreaming, you have all these situations, all of these people, events happening, interacting with each other. You get all involved and you believe what's happening until you wake up and you realize, oh, all those people, situations and events were all me. None of those were happening. Nothing was happening. It was just me sitting there thinking, dreaming. I would say like when we die, a piece of God wakes up and realizes, oh, I was just dreaming that I was Eric for a while there. <laughs> that was an interesting dream. I think that's what makes sense to me as what is happening, at least metaphorically speaking, on a large scale, because we're we're experiencing something here that was purposefully created, intelligently designed, like every everything around us speaks to there being order and, and complexity beyond any kind of Big Bang or some abstraction like that. And so we're here in this created realm and we can look around and see a lot of things that aren't perfect you know like i was saying like we get we all get sick and age and die some people are born with terrible infirmities and are tortured basically their whole life until they die and and their entire experience on earth is one of pain um like i said most people that is most people's end of life experience your life basically is going to get more and more painful and torturous, and then one day you're going to die. That's that's just one aspect. And then, you know, like I said, parasites. Why are there parasites? Why is that a thing? Did, did Earth need to have parasites for it to work when God was creating Earth? Um, you know, everything was absolutely perfect. And then he's like, oh, wait a minute. Let's create ringworms and tapeworms and, uh, you know, ticks and, you know, there's so many things like that that you could point to that aren't necessary. And if, if I was the all powerful creator about to create a world that I was going to dream in or send subjective packets of myself, you know, Eric, I'm, I get to be a character in my video game that I just created. Well, I would say that this video game, it's, it's I don't like it like that much. Like I think, like just sitting here doing a thought experiment, I think I could create a better video game just by taking the, what's already here, because there's a lot of great stuff here, and then taking out a bunch of negative things. There's just a bunch of negative stuff that does not have to be in this video game for me to play it and enjoy myself. And and furthermore, uh, it's really um, uh, uh, in sort in heating. It's really not letting me enjoy you know the fact that i'm gonna get old and die and i'm gonna forget everything and then maybe have to reincarnate again and you know uh, the, there's all of these or the fact that i have to eat to live like i haven't eaten animals for 15 years but you know we have to eat something that lives even if you just eat plants you still have to take the life of of something just to survive in this realm like that's another thing it's like why if, if this is just a video game created by a you know god and we're video game players in god's game why why the, the cannibalism like why is everything eating everything else like and there's and some things are like predators and carnivores and like that's what it does it just eats things and it's like I don't need that in my reality so the, at the base level the thing that brings me to the idea of the soul trap is something like this just the fact that there's so much negativity and and things that are neg like natural disasters why why did you do that god you could you could have had a place without them but you decided hey <laughs> and so the best answer i could come up with is well this is like a violent video game this is like a, a particular video game where you want all that stuff. 
you want predators and parasites and everyone is eating everything else and and you get mind wiped every lifetime so that you don't remember that you're a god just having a dream you think you're really eric the whole life and you're you you are the subjective experience and and so <clears throat> if that's the case then there must be other video games or at least there could be better video games or better levels in which case i want to play them i want to go there in which case this is a soul trap of some sorts unless you're saying that this reality and the way that it is is the only reality in existence and the only way it could possibly be oh you want to live in a place with no natural disasters and no parasites eric sorry it's impossible god can't create that realm <laughs> what you know what i mean god the omnipotent omniscient omnipresent creator the, there's obvious by definition there's nothing that being can't do so don't tell me that I can't live in a better realm than this. I'm so all it is basically I'm just saying that I notice things that I don't like in reality and I know that they there could be a reality that I can imagine that doesn't have these things and therefore I want to go there and I'm not satisfied with this reality. And I think that is potentially step 1 to you being able to leave this reality. And if instead you think that you were created by a benevolent, all-loving God that created this and the, this is the only reality that you could possibly live in and you have karma and if you don't live perfectly in this subpar realm with all these negative you know, aspects and psychopaths running around, if you do something that you might feel a little bit guilty for in your life review, <gasps> you now you have to come back to the school of life to, you know, solve that karma you know because you didn't do good enough to come to a better realm and, and again if we were all if we're all just subjective packets of god you know little video game characters created why why do we have to evolve into something that that deserves to live in a better realm why not why can't we just live in a better realm what what is this idea that oh you lowly humans god created you like turd on the bottom of his shoe and you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps to be worthy of living in any better realm than this one like and most religions pretty much all of them that exist today do the opposite they, they just praise whatever created this realm as being the most loving thing ever and like all you need to do is sing songs to him and pray to him or whatever and praise his name or something and there's multiple religions and you know billions of people live their life this way and they think that if you appease this deity enough that he'll let you into his special place heaven oh no, oh, no, oh, no, oh no, pray five times a day or whatever oh jesus i accept jesus into my heart and i'm so christian and i can absolve myself confess my sins blah, blah, let me into heaven what if and that's what they think is the first step to getting into a better place maybe maybe you know i'm not even going to say that's not but all i'm saying is maybe the first step isn't following these religions and praising whatever deity created this place maybe the first step to getting to a better realm is being skeptical of this one being skeptical of the deity being skeptical of the afterlife experience and the people that come to you being skeptical that this is the only reality possible, being skeptical that you did consent 100% to having your all your memories wiped and coming to this subpar realm. Skepticism is what allowed me to discover the flat earth and many other conspiracies and many other things that have enriched my life in this realm, not belief. Belief is the opposite of skepticism. And belief got me in trouble as a kid, you know, believe in Jesus like everyone else around me until I start seeing how crazy it is, you know, just as an example. But there's so many things, literally anything I would say that you believe in, you're deluding yourself. Belief is overstepping the bounds of knowledge. Believing is what people do when they don't really know. And if you really don't know, then say, I don't know. Don't create a doctrine and a dogma and believe it 
and then defend that belief against other people to the death. Just accept that you don't know. It's fine. I don't know either. If we all just accepted that we're on this common ground, religion is gone. There's no need for it. That's all religion is, is people overstepping the bounds of knowledge and then, you know, I'm in this camp, I'm in that camp. <laughs> Let's battle it out. It's like, yeah, but none of you know. What are you battling? Just be in the camp that we're all actually in, which is the I don't know camp, and we can discuss it like, you know, <laughs> civilized people. <laughs> wow. That had to be one of the most powerful 20 minutes uh, I think anybody has ever spoken. I mean, you talk about the flat earth being the mag most magnificent, the greatest conspiracy, but really the soul trap probably trumps it, no pun intended. But I mean, what you just laid out there is just incredible. I, uh, yeah, I think what you said is what most intelligent people think when they that are open minded uh, about the soul trap and religion. Uh, it. it I mean, do you, you, you talk about intelligent design. You say that this world is created, obviously, with intelligent design. You talked about the, the earth and the sun, you know, or the moon and the sun being 400 times bigger and 400 times farther away. There's, there's so many obvious uh, pieces of evidence showing that this is a creative design. Do you believe, like, I'm sure you've heard of simulation theory. I've talked about it on my channel. Do you believe that this is like a coded universe cr created by a, a creator, you know, with math uh, and maybe code? Or do you think it's more of something that is intangible, something that is maybe eth eth ethereal? Do you have any thoughts on that, the whole simulation argument and the movie, the, the Matrix movies and all that stuff? Right. Um, yeah, simulation theory seems to be the new phrase being given to the most ancient concept that there is, which is the Vedic, the Vedic um, scriptures, which say that this entire reality is maya, which means illusion. And so the idea is that all of physical reality is ultimately illusory. And the true reality is beyond material, the material realm. So it's consciousness, basically. And I would say that makes a lot more sense to me than the opposite worldview, which is what's being pushed today, the materialist worldview that out of nowhere and nothing, a big bang ex explosion happens, and then consciousness and other immaterial things like thoughts and emotions and everything just suddenly come into existence all through physical means. Now that, I mean, no matter what kind of explosion <laughs> you create, I like that can never make sense to me. But if you go the other way around, and instead of starting with the physicality, you start with the immaterial consciousness. So there's an immaterial consciousness that potentially always exists. It just is. So it's awareness, you know, like the, the thing that you, you're aware, I'm aware. All, all the animals are aware. It's it's the capacity for experience is what awareness is. So the capacity for experience probably just always is. And the original experiencer, the originating consciousness, would be the thing people like to call God. And uh, that would be what is dreaming this dream that we are all subjective players in. And so consciousness in that sense, like I said, every night we dream and we think we're in these worlds. I'm, I'm in a castle and I was a dragon and all these things are happening, there's trees and mountains. I believe it. And then I think I'm there and there's all these other characters that are in it. And then, ooh, and then I wake up and it's like, oh, whoa, none of those things existed. None of those people existed. That castle didn't exist. The dragon didn't exist. The only thing that existed was my consciousness. And my consciousness was creating that physical, that seemingly physical world, that maya, that illusory physical world, that simulation. And by and, and that's what I would say we're doing here is we're living in this simulation or this 
created reality and we are created beings and we've been separated from our creator in such a way that we're all in that I don't know space that I have said again that's another thing that it's like why why do we have to not know couldn't the creator couldn't you dream this reality and know that you were doing it and it would still be fun like it, is it that bad to have that little inkling in the back of your consciousness to know that this is a created reality and and you are god you have to have a complete memory wipe these are questions i have i don't have the answer to it i don't know i can't remember <laughs> don't remember if i consented to this or not and, and i don't know if it was uh if a uh, full disclosure was given before i consented that's the other thing maybe i consented but there was all these things and they told me it was going to be this way and maybe it wasn't so got lots of questions on that one but anyway to answer your question yeah simulation matrix maya whatever you want to call it it that makes way more sense to me than big bang cosmology everything comes from material explanation and there's no spirituality or you know immaterial thing in existence hmm. i definitely think the soul trap versus the the whole benevolent god and you know this is a learning uh, lab or so to speak for us for consciousness it's uh it's definitely one of the biggest one of the one of the biggest uh truths i don't know or you know i guess you would say one of the one of the biggest discussions or debates uh not i mean the flat earth is another thing it's more physical but there's a lot of there's a lot to this eric i don't know uh i'm just, I'm just going to continue on exploring it and reading more on the soul trap um i want to know more about it but mm. i don't want viewers to get upset with me just because i'm looking into it or talking yeah. about it likewise yeah. yeah that's just where my journey has taken me i don't find it to be a belief and i'm not um wholeheartedly saying that you know this matrix reincarnation soul trap idea the way it's been laid out is some new doctrine some new dogma certainly not it's the exact opposite of what we need all i'm saying is that when you have a open mind to look at the available evidence from near-death experiences to you know ayahuasca dmt and these kind of things to um, hip hypno regression um, the overarching message that seems to keep coming back is that this very well could be either a school of life or a soul trap and uh, i think like you said i think it's a very interesting subject um, to delve into and not necessarily need to believe one way or the other because we'll all find out when the time comes and that i think is go time like i think the moment of death rather than being this ending is actually a beginning like the most important beginning in a sense we may be in a purgatory right now and this is all just the pre game and the real game starts the moment you die and that very well may be the test that decides whether you have to come back to this purgatory or if you get to graduate somewhere else and i use that term graduate when we talk about the life being a school or a prison if it's a school you can there's there's two ways out of school right you can graduate or you can drop out with prison you either break out or you serve your time the school of life people seem to say that serve your time this world is 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 great but it's not the best and you deserve to be in this subpar realm for many 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 lifetimes until you can graduate to the better realm and i say what about the people that just want to drop out and if that's not an option is this really a school mm -hmm. if i can't drop out of it it sounds more like a prison just like public schools in some places nowadays that are mandatory and they have compulsory laws so that you cannot not go to school and learn their propagandistic curriculum and be forced to only take bathroom breaks when the you know security guard at the head of the blackboard allows you to and many things that we 
accept as being school are very prison-like. And I wonder if that metaphor could extend to this entire realm where people with rose-colored glasses want to think that they're experiencing a school and they're trying to get good grades and they're, you know, getting A plus on their karma reports. When in reality, maybe they were just tricked into coming into a prison and there is no way to graduate. And the only way out is to break out. It's very well could be a possibility. And the only way that you can, you know, if that was the truth, then you have to at least be open enough to questioning if that's a possibility. Otherwise, you won't even see the prison break opportunity. You'll just stay behind bars lifetime after lifetime, trying to be the best prisoner possible so that the warden will love you so much that he decides that he's going to let you out of his prison and go to some other place that he's not even a warden of, which is another thing. Like, is the deity that rules this place the ultimate deity? Or is he just a warden? deity that rules this place and we're all praising and singing songs to potentially a psychopathic or very negative deity that has us corralled in one particular place of you know one dimension keeping us away from potentially much better dimensions with other deity figures um but, you know the could have created other worlds or what whatnot, you know, getting into speculation territory here, but idea being that there's just so many possibilities out there. What are people doing when they're just narrowing themselves down? Like they read this one book called the Quran, or they read this one book called the Bible, or whatever the book is, and they're like, all of the answers are in here. Every, and I'm gonna believe everything that this book says, even though most of it is clearly metaphorical. And a lot of things, you know, go back and forth. So one thing and then it says the other, you know, the Bible can be made to, you, you can use it to claim basically this, that, and the other thing, if you interpret it that way. And that's the way most religions are. And that's a big problem is when you take something that can be interpreted 180 degrees one way or the other, depending on who's interpreting it, and then claim that that's the ultimate truth. So the ultimate truth is uh, completely subjective and anyone can interpret it anyway and think that it's however is, is sensible to them. Like, again, that brings us back to where the baseline of what I'm saying, we're all at anyway. <laughs> the baseline is we all don't know and we're all subjective. We're in these bodies, we're born here, limited knowledge, incapable of having absolute knowledge until maybe after death, we might, you know, so it's just, I'm just, I'm reiterating my point here, but point being that all religions, all belief systems, anything that is outside of your experience, you don't know it. And so don't believe it because you're just creating more problems in society than need to happen by doing so. Yeah. Yeah. What you said about the creator of this world being, it could just be, the warden, not the supreme creator, and he could be uh, masochistic, and and uh, really uh, we're 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 paying homage to it, or him or her or whatever it is. But that's a scary thought that we're kind of stuck here, and God is not what you think it is. Um, I think that's one of the reasons people gravitate towards religions because it comforts them. They get some some sense of feeling like. Uh, some, some sense of control. But really, our lives could be over in, in the flash. You can mm -hmm. literally be driving your car and you can get hit and you're, you're dead. You're, you lose consciousness. But I think when I think of a soul trap, I think of all the people that have suffered under all these regimes like Stalin and Hitler. And, you know, and just there's so many different ways people were tortured throughout the, throughout the centuries. Uh, impaling all kinds of uh, of horrible things, just just horrible. And I've gone on, you know, I've gone on the internet and I've looked at all those different ways. 
Um, I was even thinking about putting a video about that. It'd probably be controversial, but I was going to even put uh, a Post Malone song and show these uh, these horrible images. Uh, I, I don't know if it would be approved by YouTube, but uh, it would be a powerful message. Like, and and the video would be like, "Is this a soul trap? Then why is this occurring?" Like you said, the creator can do something about it, but it doesn't. It made it this way or allowed it to be. If it even if it evolved this way, Tom Campbell, somebody I had on the channel many times previously, like uh, three times, but I've talked about him quite a lot. He says the this whole universe, this reality, was evolved to be this way. It's not that God wanted it to be exactly like this. So that's why there are predators, and that's why everything is the way it is because evolved to be that way. And it just it, it's just leaving it alone because. We as consciousness could inhabit bodies here and play out lives and learn. It's a virtual reality trainer for consciousness, so to speak. So it's not changing it. That's, you know, one argument. But I I kind of side with you. You know, like, why does it have to be? Why does every every organism have to eat every other organism to survive? It, it really is very cruel. But like you said, maybe there's a place, another reality that we graduate to, or maybe we have to break out of this, but it's up to each one of us individually because when we die, we die alone. We go through that that transition stage and that death process alone. And who knows what will happen to our consciousness when we die. Maybe we're gonna forget all of this. As much as we think we could be conscious about all this right up to the point of death, and then it could be taken all away from us. We see the lights. We see a, a long lost loved one right there and we get that overwhelming feeling and then all well, maybe all the memories like we have a, our memories are wiped out when we come into this life. Maybe they're kind of wiped out when we leave as well. That's what Tom Campbell says. So we don't know. We'll find out though. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's the best way to be is to just exist in the mystery and accept that agnosticism is really the best position that we can be in about most things and pretty much everything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> personally, I have my I have my, my little belief that gives me comfort. And I don't know if you ever read Autobiography of Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, that book, but mm -hmm. it, it, it gives me some sense of comfort and belief, and I fully admit it, just to believe maybe that, you know, if we, if we meditate and we're good and we, you know, that there is, we can't ascend, you know, that whole, the whole, that whole line where, you know, you, karma and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. I think we got to keep an open mind to, to it because we, I don't know. I, I haven't been to the cave with Babaji and Lahiri Mahasaya and, you know, it's fun to read about and it's fun to think that that's what the reality is and that we have some measure of control by our thoughts and our actions and that we can level up like a video game and 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 we can be rewarded uh, but like you said we can do all these things and we're really just paying false homage to a malevolent you know warden <laughs> so uh i would it, say that it's it's a good idea to try to um do the best you can in both aspects like so we don't know if the earth is a prison or a school so live your life like it could be either in the sense of you know i'm i'm vegan i try to have compassion for all people and for all animals this is my job i'm trying to spread the truth about some of the most i think important subjects in the world i'm living my life i feel in the way that if i was god or whatever like i'd want eric to do this like I'm being who and living my life in the way that if if karma is a thing, then I'm trying to win it. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, but yeah. yeah. I have but I also have this idea that we've talked about, this soul trap thing where I I also don't necessarily agree with this system called karma. And it's similar to like being in a curriculum in a school. And say you've got a teacher and you've got you're in chemistry class or something and you just don't agree with the way he teaches the class or maybe not chemistry let's go with cosmology so you got a cosmology teacher telling you it's a heliocentric universe or something and you just don't agree it's best to live both ways i mean live like there is karma 
you know, be the best person you can be. But also, I think it's fine to be skeptical of the entire system of karma and ask yourself whether is that a necessary thing that needs to exist yeah. in, 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 a, in a person's life? Why can't we already live in heaven in a place where we're already fully compassionate and refined beings who treat each other the way we should be treated? Like, why didn't God separate himself into that reality? And that is the only reality where everything is heavenly and wonderful. Like, that could be possible. Just like it's possible for there to be a hellish reality where everything is terrible and awful 24-7, which I don't think we're in that either. I think we're somewhere in between, which makes me think that there's probably worse places than this and better places. So it's kind of like a purgatory or something of that sense. The main difference I'm saying between the school of life and the prison thing is the school of life people are saying that you have to karma your way out, you have to graduate. Whereas the soul trap people say you have to drop out. You have to be skeptical of everything the teachers are teaching to the point that you no longer believe the whole system, you drop out of their school completely and you homeschool, <laughs> teach yourself. And, and if, with that metaphor, I'm all for homeschooling. I think it's way better than public schooling. I'm all for people creating their own curriculum and educating themselves based on the books and documentaries and having the discussions that they want to have rather than having some university or whatever decide for you. And then you just become a puppet and you get a little piece of paper afterwards because you became a standardized robot with the, you know, this standardized degree that they gave you. Um, it's, I think it's way, way more fruitful to be self-directed and go where you think, you know, your education should lead you. And that's what most homeschoolers do, is that they don't have a super set curriculum, but they base it on the child's interests and let him delve into the thing that he's most interested in at the time. Um, that's what I've done ever since leaving school. It's what I noticed in myself that made me leave school was that I was spending all my time in the library researching the things that I wanted to and my homework for my school subjects was like work. I was like, oh, I gotta do this so that I can get back to researching the things that I wanna learn about. And so I didn't continue with school after my bachelor's degree, even though everyone around me was saying that that was the thing to do, that's what I should do, especially with the bachelor's in philosophy, there's not much you can do with it. You basically need to get a higher degree and then teach philosophy, that's all, this, <laughs> that's all you can do with that degree. <laughs> but for me, the the whole thing with philosophy in the beginning was like, no, I'll get a philosophy degree and then I'll be happy with whatever I do with my life. Because to me, philosophy was about just learning about life and how life works. And um, I mean, it, literally happiness was one of the things studied. I also did psychology for a year thinking that might work, but I wrote an asbestos head actually about a, a guy who was a philosopher and psychologist and that was based on my experience. And he said in his clinical work, he uses philosophy much more than psychology because he finds philosophy challenges their current understanding and looks to the future. Whereas psychology is always looking at the past and childhood traumas and trying to dredge up something that they can, you know, some victim narrative that they can carry around forever. So in, in my book, the, the psychologist basically uses philosophical arguments against his clients rather, rather than doing the typical psychologist thing. Um, he just makes them uncomfortable and asks them questions that um, most psychologists wouldn't ask. Um, again, I went on another tangent just to say that uh, school curriculums and public education forced things like that are inferior to self-directed homeschooling and educating yourself based on whatever you're currently interested at the time. You know, everybody probably that went to public school remembers being forced to learn stuff that you're just not interested in at all. Like, I've never been as bored as that. That's probably the most bored I've been in my life is having to sit through, you know, the periodic table of the elements for years, like many years of just for instance that or algebra or certain things like that are just, and I would just sit there day after day, I'd sleep at my desk, it was so boring. But 
also try to get A's. I, I graduated with A's and B's. That's the other thing. It's like talking about uh, the school of life. It's like I did the same thing with school. Like I tried to graduate and do the best I could. But ultimately, now that I'm out of there, my advice to everyone is just drop out. Like I don't advise anyone go to school, like go to any school, especially not college, but even regular school. It's homeschooling is still better than that. Unless your parents are terrible, but I mean, if you've got normal, loving parents, you've got two adults at home that love you and care about you and are going to teach you about the world versus one adult in some that doesn't know you and 30 other kids all in a room and they're trying to teach you how to be a, a good human in this world. Like homeschooling just makes so much more sense, um, both both uh, my metaphor here for both actual schooling and in this this reality of whether this is a school or a prison, figuring it out for yourself. Don't just believe the curriculums that already exist, the Islam curriculum, the Christian curriculum, or even the soul trap reincarnation curriculum that's starting to happen now. So, you know, it's become a subject that you can, you have a, there's like a box, <laughs> it's being boxed in. But for me, this subject that we're talking about is the ultimate non-box because I don't know. The soul, tra soul trap is just where all the evidence that I've learned so far in my life about the afterlife has led me. But the ultimate test will be when I get to experience the afterlife, just like we're saying about absolutely everything. Experience is the ultimate arbiter and don't make your full belief or your full decision until you get to that place where you get to have the experience. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything you just said, including the homeschooling. If I had a child, I would homeschool them. I, I believe that in this world that we're growing up in where you could do almost anything you want on the internet, uh, you don't really need schooling. You just need to have some loving parents that, that teach you the ways of the world and what, you know, you could you can learn what you find is interesting. And then if you decide what you want, there are online courses, there are books, you, you can do whatever you want, open a business. You could almost do anything just on the internet. Now, of course, there's there are certain things that uh, our society mandates that you have to have an education in. Uh, if you're a nurse, doctor, lawyer, all that stuff, you know, if you really want to do it, you got to go through their hoops and, you know, do all their stuff to do it. And that's fine if you want to. But it's not necessary. It's the way to go. In independent all the way. We don't really need any more group think. I like um, a lot of people say we need unity in the conspiracy community and we all need to come together and stuff. It's like I think the opposite. I'm all for diversity. The new world order is all about unity. The new world order is all about us all coming together under one banner. How about we all have our own <laughs> independent, diverse ways of thinking? Like there was um, a video I just watched that was really good. Something called something like uh, is decentralization the the amp like will de can decentralization save the world? I believe it was called. And it was by a channel called Academy of Ideas, and uh, I absolutely have thought that was exactly the answer for so long. And that video is great because it the whole video is just about that that one subject, um, and it's it's what we really need. Uh, now is the decentralization of most most systems in society from money to education to politics. If we can get from these huge groupings that we have now, like the UN and the Federal Reserve and public schools, mandatory public schools, and go back to homeschooling, you know, tutors, get back to um, smaller forms of government, you know, local communities, villages, the the smaller scale your governance is, the more applicable it is to the people around you. When you get to the world scale and you're supposed to have two people from every country meeting at the UN or something and making one world mandates that everyone from Chad in America to Eric in Thailand to Zimbabwe and Timbuktu all have to follow when they're completely irrelevant and they have no feet on the ground there to make these decisions. It should be the exact opposite is that 
uh, governance from the local level is paramount. And any sort of federal or world mandates that try to come around uh, should be laughed at at the local level, unless you like them, unless they make sense, unless you want to include those into your local structure of society. But we're doing the exact opposite of that right now. We are upscaling and making bigger and bigger groups. And even people who are solution oriented, like I'm saying, a lot of people, they seem to think that we all need to come together and have unity and, and, all, and we all need to speak from the same script and we all have to think the same way and all this stuff. And apparently there's no shills whatsoever. So there's no controlled opposition anywhere. And so you all have to agree and all be part of the same group. I would say that's a problem, like Alex Jones calls the turd in the punch bowl, which I think he is one of the biggest ones there is. <laughs> uh, and the idea being that when you put a turd in a punch bowl, well, the whole punch stinks now. And all you would have had to do was not put the turd in. So in other words, not have unity, not be claiming that unity is what we need, even with the turdy people. No, I mean, if you find, if, if you've established that someone is outside of your narrative or spouting lies or disinformation, you don't need unity with that person. You need to expose that person. It's basically the exact opposite. Um, so I think it's the same with everything from the all the way up to the biggest political problem, all the way down to the smallest little conspiracy community issue. The answer is diversity, not unity. Everyone do their own thing. Everyone have their own perspective. Be yourself individuate herald your subjectivity you know be your own expert be your own authority and then suddenly all of these other authority figures that have been heralded for so long and are creating all of these deceptions are going to fall by the wayside because we're all get, getting back to bare bones which is our experience what we actually can know for ourselves no longer have to believe all these authorities on tv with their fisheye lenses and their CGI <laughs> space cars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that idea. I think it would be, I, I was just envisioning what it would be like if everybody just respected each other, if everybody allowed each other to just explore and, and let find their own truth. I, I think that would be a beautiful thing. Um, but I don't, I, think, I, I, don't, I don't see it happening anytime soon. And this world's getting more centralized every, every year. Uh, unfortunately so i don't know there's been there's been some breakaway uh people i don't know if you ever heard of bhagwan Sri rajneesh or osho osho yeah yeah his name that was his name but that's his yeah name. yeah bhagwan Sri rajneesh and changed it to osho but he took a group of his followers came from india and he took them to oregon they bought this huge plot of land and they just wanted to live there and be free and but he was like their leader not so much like a leader like he was telling them what to do but he was he was he was like the the religious guru and but it was he he believed in free love being free not you know not being with being away from the government and all that stuff and so he was trying to create that and then he was brought down from the inside and the government eventually kicked him out of the country but these things have been tried but they don't always succeed or most of the time they don't succeed but it would be great to have a, a community of like-minded people like that even if you had a small group five or six people that could be like that to serve as an example i think would be great as a grassroots it's a good example of what we're saying here is that when a small group like that breaks off from the big centralized authority well they're smushed they're crushed like the little bug group that they are Mm -hmm. But uh, oh, now, now that I'm saying that as a metaphor, I'm thinking of that bug's life analogy. That's exactly the, from that movie where he's got the little, and then all the bugs come together. Well, this is the same thing. If all the bugs create their own Osho communities simultaneously, now the one centralized thing that's supposed to come in and crush them, first of all, it's got way too many places to go crush, and it's become way smaller because you've all branched off into your own place. So the crushing thing is, has become a smaller thing to the point that there will be no central authority left to crush the little bug communities. So in that example, th there you go from that kids movie, 
it's already showing you that diversity, how it works, and, and it's just like this. The only reason the Osho type communities aren't working now is because it's one at a time. It's just this one little group and it's easy for the centralized um, government that has a monopoly on violence and power to crush them anywhere they are. But if people wake up to the fact that government in its statist form currently is illegitimate completely. The only legitimate government would be voluntarist government, which is a whole nother subject. But if we, uh, until we get into that, we need to create these kind of breakout societies that, that there's that saying that it's your duty to go against an unjust law. In other words, if, if there's some mandate that the government's making, then you feel that that is unacceptable and not how reality should be it's it's your job to break that law now most people you know most people don't want to live that way or, or hear that kind of thing but if you're not doing that then how is that any different than you know the the soldiers you know in, in concentration camps and stuff that they claim uh were to blame because oh i was just taking orders i was just doing what, what i was supposed to do and but History doesn't redeem them. History doesn't think that just following orders is acceptable. History says, no, you have to go against unjust orders. You have to be compassionate. And so, I mean, it's the same thing here right now with this world government that's being set up. And it could be that easy if, if we could all recognize and, and do it at once. Just like you said, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot, and, and I think it it is the way is <clears throat> for us to get back to small community living. And how do you do that? Well, to go from where we are now to that, it basically has to be like Osho did. One guy or a group of people who has enough money has to buy the land and then you have to use that land and defend it, basically. And we all have to do that on a big enough scale to the point that we get back to the type of small village community living where there is no central authority that can come crashing down and crush us anytime we start a you know 100 acre plot of land that uh, you know you can be naked you know uh, what do you call them nudists or something and we have our own money system that involves seashells or whatever you know now the government can't come down and force us to wear clothes and use paper money because why why should they in the first place I would love to live in a world like that. I would love to live in a world where every every few miles or every couple hundred miles or however long, you get into a completely new area with a completely new culture and the freedom to have a new political system and a new monetary system. And here they do barter and there they have socialism and here's a voluntarist society, etc. Like, wouldn't that be way better than one centralized new world order statist government under UN control that everyone seems to think is like an inevitable eventuality right now. No, that would be the worst possible outcome. Um, I would say the real inevitable eventuality is what I'm saying. Eventually it has to get back to this because that's the real thing. We really live in our small communities. Nobody is a world citizen. The people in the UN sitting there in their little semicircle they don't live in every country in the world simultaneously. <laughs> they have to be somewhere and wherever they are, that should be the only place that they have a say in. Why, why do these people that live so far away from us have any say in how we're gonna live our life here? And you know, that that's, should be so obvious to people. And that's why local governments, governance and getting back to small scale living and doing kind of experiments like was it Koresh, David Koresh or Osho or these kind of people that are you know the government hates these kind of people you, you try to do your own thing on a piece of land with a bunch of supporters and you want to create your own little system outside of this outside of the system but inside their geographical area because there is no geographical area left that they don't have claim to um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is one world now. There are no places 
unless there's places beyond Antarctica that they're not allowing us to go or the North Pole or whatever, but all of the discovered lands, they're all statist governments now. So there's nowhere you can go to escape your statist government. No, it's been a great conversation. It's been a great conversation. I really, it was worth the long wait to finally talk with you. I do appreciate, you know, that we finally got on together. And um, I think we have a lot in common in the sense, you know, I don't know if you know, but I was, uh, I was a vegan and vegetarian for many, many years, starting when I was 17 years old. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, I love your stuff. I love, I love your videos, your books, all the content you put out, um, everything that you do. You know, I, 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 uh, I got to give you a lot of credit. You know, you, you're one of the most entertaining and fascinating people on the internet and you bring the knowledge. So thank you for being you. I appreciate that. Thanks, man. Sure. Well, it's been fun sure. for me too. Um, I've been watching your channel lately and trying to catch up uh, with what you're doing so we could, we could have a good discussion. And uh, it's very interesting. I like, I like, like you said, that you are actually kind of like a centrist and it's like that has become the extreme position to hold nowadays is to, to be open to the left and the right and to maybe not make such a hasty decision that's like so extreme like how can you do that chad i see, I see in your comment section so um i think that's great i was just talking in another podcast about how i think the the middle path as buddhism uh, espouses is often you know the best way if, you know going too far to any one extreme basically just sets up a dichotomy and the world has a way a yin yang way of setting up a polar opposite to whatever your extreme is and in that sense it all balances out anyway and so you're better off just being balanced yourself and, and holding a more central centrist position on things um just just in that sense so that you're not setting up some dichotomy it's like the second you go too far to one extreme on any facet of life life has a way of creating the op equal and opposite thing to attract that thing into your life to bring you right back to your baseline. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So it's like you can avoid that by understanding that you should probably just stay stay in the middle anyway. Don't go too far to any one extreme. Yeah, well, I'm 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 always looking. I'm I'm going to continue exploring, continue talking to people. I may not figure it out before I die, but it's fun uh, looking at all the possibilities. Right on, dude. Yeah, that's the way yeah. to do it.